we figured out what I do like in books. Now it's time to figure out what I don't like. <laughs> Hey friends, welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all good. So recently I did a video called a five star audit where I went through books I given five stars and I picked out similar features, tropes, aspects of books that I'm consistently giving five stars. And a lot of you asked me to do a one star audit. So that's what we're gonna be doing today. We're gonna be figuring out what do I hate in books? Now, if I were to do a one star audit, we'd literally have like five books to pull from. I very rarely give one stars. It's literally only if it's like offensive or like I really, really, really hate it. But I feel like as time goes on, I'm especially getting good at not picking up books that I'm gonna hate that much. So this is gonna be like a one and two star audit. I'm gonna be using one and two star books that I have read. But yeah, let's just head over to Goodreads, have a look at what I've got and see what am I rating low? So when I did this for the five star audit, I had to have three books that had that trope or feature in. This, because I have so many less one or two stars, we're gonna have to change up the barometers a bit. I'm looking for at least two books, ideally three, ideally three books that, that have had that feature but if it's only two and like maybe I've subconsciously realized I don't like that and I've stopped doing that kind of thing, I still think it's something we can talk about. The rules don't apply. And I looked for ten features in the five star video. Again, I've read so many less two and one stars than I have five stars. So I'm gonna look for between five to eight. If we can make it to 10, I'll be so happy. But if we only get like six, that's fine because like proportionally I've read so many less one and two stars. So maybe something that we can start with is like spiritual self-help. <laughs> I've, probably, I've read at least two that I've given low ratings. So we've got Only Love Is Real. Oh God, that was a Kylie Jenner book. <laughs> that was one of Kylie Jenner's favorite books. Yeah, Power of Your Subconscious Mind. Oh yeah, The Untethered Soul. I didn't like any of those. The Untethered Soul was when I read voluntarily. Cause here's the thing, I love yoga. I'm so happy. I swear, oh, I swear crazy. I've been I doing swear. yoga. Right. And I love meditation and I love bettering yourself. And like when I watch yoga with Adrian, right, <laughs> my queen, <laughs> literally I'm like emotionally bonded. <laughs> You know, when I watch her, I want to kind of think the way that she does and I want to look after myself in that way. But then when I try and read some spiritual self-help, sometimes it doesn't work. It just doesn't seem for me in like written format. Now, if Yoga with Adrian were to write a spiritual-esque self-help book, I think I'd give it five stars because I just love her. But all these guys I keep reading, mm-mm. So yeah, first was spiritual self-help books and... <laughs> in principle I don't I'm open to that like I said I love yoga and meditation like I'm open to us talking about that I listen to a podcast what is a podcast called it's a podcast by a Buddhist monk that I listen to it's re I really enjoy it and I enjoy the way they speak the way out is in zen and the art of living I, I like that I love that podcast but book form something about it just don't like in terms of what I have on my TBI I don't really have a lot because as you can tell it's something I figured out I don't like but I do have the tree of yoga and I do I do want to love this because it's maybe about yoga maybe I'll be more into it like I you know I really really enjoy yoga and uh, you know my queen yoga with Adrienne recommended it but she also recommended some other books I didn't like so I don't know, we shall see, but hopefully I will enjoy this. But yeah, like for all of these, we're gonna try and find, you know, books on my TBR that have that feature because that's what we did for the five star on it. But like, I don't know if we're, <laughs> I don't know if it's gonna be as easy because I try not to buy stuff I don't think I'm gonna like. Next, we can probably say, when I read a book and it's like young YA, I keep having an issue with that. Midnight in Everwood, this Midnight in Everwood is not good. That was the first book I read this year and I hated it. You've also got The Gilded Ones by Namina Fauna, Belladonna by Adeline Grace, Cinderella is Dead. There's just like quite a few that I I felt like read young. Right, next was Young YA, which I have no way of telling what on my TBR is gonna be Young YA. I really don't. The Young YA books sneaking onto my TBR. Because that's my biggest problem, I think, with these books, is that it almost needs to be like a separate age category. Like, these are books that I think should be marketed towards like 12 and 13 year olds. 11, 12 and 13, right? I was reading YA by the time I was 11. I don't think 11 year olds are really reading middle grade. They're reading <laughs> YA. And I think it's so important that this YA exists and these books exist for this age group. But what you want to be reading 
at like 11 and 12 versus 16 is like very different things. And yes, I think also the part of the problem is we get used to YA that's really written for adult audiences because that's an issue as well. So I think this should exist right? But I just don't want to be reading it. <laughs> and I know I don't, but people aren't talking about when a YA book is released, oh this is a young YA. People aren't talking about that. And again, this is an issue I have with like expectations versus reality, right? Middle grade, when I read it, I really enjoy it because I know what I'm getting myself in for. But when I pick up a YA book, I expect it to be similar to other YA books that I read, and then it ends up not being similar <laughs> to other YA books that I read. I've heard some people say maybe gallant, which makes me nervous because a lot of people have told me that I'm going to love this as well. It is following a 16 year old, but I heard some people going, oh, is this middle grade? So I don't know, maybe Gallant, maybe I'll not like Gallant. But yeah, I think it just is like an expectations situation. I have quite a few murder mysteries, I think, that I've given two stars. We have got If I Disappear, Marion Lane and the Midnight Murder, Malabar Hill, The Widows of Malabar Hill, uh, Agatha Christie and Murder on the Links. We've got a one star somewhere for Agatha. The big four. Oh girl, not the big four. <laughs> like I'm not gonna say murder mysteries <laughs> as a feature that I give low ratings, but I think I am so picky now with murder mysteries because I read a lot of them and I love them and I expect so much from them that like, I think perhaps like there's certain examples on here like Widows of Malabar Hill that I feel like if I were to read a fantasy book and feel how I f felt about the fantasy book, how I felt about that, like in terms of quality and story, I would give the fantasy a three star, but I am just so disappointed because I'm so excited in time I'm getting to read a murder mystery that I am like, how dare you, two star, two star, how dare you. So I'd say like murder mysteries that disappoint me, but there's no way of like knowing that. <laughs> before going into them. But it is a common theme that if I feel let down by a murder mystery, whereas perhaps I would have given that book a three star in a different genre, I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Two star. So yeah, we have another expectations versus reality here. This is again, one that I can't really draw out because I hope all the mystery and the murder mysteries I have on my TBI I'm gonna love. But when they disappoint me, they disappoint me. Like, <laughs> Because all they gonna do is disappoint me. We really don't get along. Like if they disappoint me, it's like being let down by like a close friend, you know? If you're let down by someone you thought would let you down, who cares, right? If you're let down by someone you, you thought would never betray you, then it, it hits hard. So again, like I don't have any that I could show you that I think are gonna disappoint me because I really hope they're not going to. But inevitably there's some imposters here <laughs> that, I, that are gonna betray my trust, but we don't know until we get there, which I guess is part of the beauty. <laughs> But before we get into the rest of the video, I want to say a big thank you to the sponsor of this video, which is Atlas VPN. I have got a steal Black Friday deal for you because now you can get Atlas VPN for only $1.70. $1.70 with six months extra with a 30 day money back guarantee. This is the best VPN deal on the market right now. Atlas VPN is great for unlocking all your favorite content from around the world. Can't access Friends or like any other legendary show that you want to watch on your Netflix while being abroad. Board, that's not a problem because Atlas VPN has got you covered. You can also use Atlas VPN to keep your Google searches private so you can search the web with real and organic results without it tracking your activity. Something that's so great is Atlas VPN is more than a VPN. It blocks all malicious links, ads and trackers and tells you when someone is trying to steal your data which is such an added benefit for a VPN. You can also save money using it because you can get the best deals when shopping online be that for subscription services or flights or hotels. And something that is so great is that using Atlas VPN, you can protect unlimited devices. So your subscription has unlimited devices. There is no limit. You don't need to get a new subscription for different devices. So again, make sure to check out the amazing Black Friday deal where you can get Atlas VPN for only $1.70 per month, plus six months extra with a 30 day back money guarantee. So be quick and check out the link in the description. This is the best offer of the year. It's a limited time offer. So make sure you check it out down below. Okay, back into looking for the tropes. I really, I don't know how we're gonna do from now on. <laughs> oh, another one that we have to obviously say is split timeline stories. <laughs> Cause I don't like these. Now this can either be like one timeline is the present day, one timeline is set in the past, or it can be we're following maybe two perspectives and they're following completely different storylines. I don't mind it when there's multiple, I love it in fact, when there's multiple perspectives, but I want us to all be contributing, contributing. <laughs> 
<laughs> contributing to the same storyline, okay? So for this, we have got, there's loads. <laughs> Shiver has that, An Ember in the Ashes has that. I could say, I think the ones we're meant to find, you could argue, has that. Hairpin Bridge kind of has that. Oh, next year in Havana definitely has that. That's one where it's set in the present day versus the past. Yeah, I don't like split timeline slash storyline books. I like it, multiple perspectives, but I want us to all be following the same story. I want a cohesive story. Okay, split timelines is an interesting one. Again, because you don't always hear people talk about them. Sometimes I pick a book up and it's got a split timeline and I'm like, we didn't discuss this. <laughs> I just I'm feel so, sorry. so deceived. I know, but like, like, honestly, we're I just in feel this. So we're all deceived. deceived. Are there any on my TBR that I know have got split timelines? No. Here's the thing, right? I don't mind it in books when there's like an obviously subordinate timeline. It's when they're equal that I find it difficult. So like I recently read In My Dreams I Hold a Knife and I loved that, but I felt like the present day timeline was obviously the most like serious timeline, you know? It was the main story and it was like feeding information to the other timeline, but I don't mind that. It's when it's two storylines or two timelines that are like separate stories that I object to. So like, I'm pretty sure the It Girl by Ruth Ware has flashback scenes, maybe. It has like before and after. That could make me not like it. But I feel like it's okay if like the present day is the main timeline and the before is informing what we find out in the present. I don't mind that. So Mm, this one is a risk. I'm a bit nervous because I love Ruth Ware, but this could be the first Ruth Ware I hate because it has split timelines. I would say, now this is, people are going to get mad at me for this, <laughs> but I would say we have more romances in here than is proportionate for how many romances I read. You know, we know I have good luck with some romances. I would say, you know, Ali Hazelwood, I always give five stars. Talia Hibbert, I gave four and five stars, but we've got His Beauty by Jack Carbon. Um, I mean, there's lots in here that have romance subplots, like Belladonna by Adeline Grace is basically a romance. <laughs> Red, White and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston, Next Year in Havana. Oh, let's not even talk about Midnight Sun. I just... <laughs> Normal People by Sally Rooney, you could class as having a romantic element. So yeah, romances aren't for me. <laughs> I don't know. No, I don't want to say romance is not for me because I've loved some romances that I've read. You know, I love Ali Hazelwood. She can do no wrong. But there's obviously some romances in there that a lot of other people have loved and I just could not get on board with. So yeah, romances. Listen, <laughs> I don't think I'm a romance girly. I'm enjoy I enjoy them from time to time. But one that I am nervous about is one of my most anticipated releases of the year that I still haven't got to is Yerba Buena by Nina Lacour. This is technically classed as a romance and I love Nina Lacour, but like, I don't know how I feel about this one. We'll have to see. I need, I need to read this soon. It's like very short. It's less than 300 pages and the font is possibly the biggest font I've ever seen in a book of the month book. It's absolutely huge. I also have Spoiler Alert by Olivia Dade. This one is one that I put off more. But again, like I love Talia Hibbert. Like I do love a good romance, but it's just sometimes they let me down. <laughs> So I don't know, we'll see. We'll see when I read these what I end up thinking about them, but this is the reason I don't pick up many romances because proportionally for how many I read, there's far too many that I've given like two stars. I also think this isn't necessarily like a feature, <laughs> but there's quite a lot of ends of series on here that I am disappointed by. I think if I like have, again, it's similar to Murder Mysteries, where if I've put all that effort into reading a whole series and I'm disappointed by the ending, whereas I would probably give that a three star in other circumstances, if it was like the first book in a series or whatever, like a standalone and I had that amount of enjoyment and thought the same thoughts, because it's the last book in a series and I've wasted my time, <laughs> I tend to rate them lower. So we've got uh, The King of Crows by Libba Bray. We've got um, Binti, The Night Masquerade. We've got Supernova <laughs> by Rosa Mayer. We've got, there's definitely more. Uh, oh yeah, Ruin and Rising by Lee <laughs> guy. So I think that that is something for me where like, if I've invested that amount of time, I don't finish many series. Apparently this is why. <laughs> Maybe this is proof I shouldn't finish series. Maybe I've been right all along and I've been trying to correct an innate instinct that is correct. Right, obviously I should just never finish a series again. So um, I'm letting go of my series goal for the year. Yup, 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 yup. Of finishing a certain amount of series, yeah. Uh... <laughs> 
again, this is very similar to expectations. Like I think that's often what makes me give a book two stars is feeling let down, you know? And if I've invested that time, I've chosen you as a series I actually finished, you know how rare that is, and you let me down? How dare you? Is there any ends of series that I fear could let me down? I'm a, I am am putting off Girls of Fate and Fury. I don't know where that is, but I'm putting off reading Girls of Fate and Fury. I'm very nervous about that one. Especially because I haven't read the last two for a long time and I haven't heard anyone really speak about Girls of Fate and Fury. I'm a little bit concerned. And Girls of Storm and Shadow was like a three star. <sighs> little bit concerned. <laughs> but again, there's no way of really knowing this until you read them and they let you down and you feel betrayed. <laughs> Okay, we've got six. Let's try and get, if we get two more and get to eight, I'll be so proud of myself. Let's try and really look at those one stars. <laughs> but I very rarely give out any one stars. So we have Girl Missing by Sophie McKenzie, which doesn't really count. That was a reread from my childhood, as was Jonas, uh, The Beautiful Dead. I was obsessed with that book when I was younger, but not anymore. The Gender Game, uh, <laughs> Rebel City of Inja. I mean, those two, I, I am not a big fan of, I mean, this is only two, and one of them is Kendall and Kylie Jenner, so like, the fates weren't <laughs> in its favour, but I am not a fan of YA dystopia, and I think I know that now. I think I've not really read any YA dystopia <laughs> since then, so I think we can count this as one. Oh god, the gender game was so bad. <laughs> this is the worst. This is the worst. This is the worst. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like sci-fi, YA, dystopia, or I don't like it. I often find it very heavy-handed with what it's trying to say. I don't think I would mind like adult dystopia quite as much, but YA is just on the nose. And I was never a dystopia girly. You remember when everyone was like, The Maze Runner, The Hunger Games, I never read any of them. I didn't like them. I was still in my paranormal romance era at 12 years old at that point so it's just never been for me and I think it's just something that like and not not as much of it comes out anymore but I think if something were to come out I don't think I would read it yeah why a dystopia is not for me it's never been for me I was never a maze runner what's the other one divergent hunger games never was that girly I don't think I have any YA uh sci-fi on my tbr both of those books that i read were for videos neither of them were ones that i picked up because i was interested in that book and i think the gender game was like I, for booktubers give me reading prompts video and it was like pick pick up a one star prediction or something and it was a one star <laughs> so i don't pick this up in my own time i know pretty much to stay away from this it's not for me again i don't mind like adult dystopian you know i think i'm gonna really love station 11 by emily st john mandel like you know these kind of books i think i do enjoy but I think YA often have a message that they want to give that can be a little bit like heavy-handed and that's just not what I'm looking for okay let's 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 just end it with unreliable narrator right we've got the silent patient no <laughs> up here we've got rock paper scissors by Alice Feeney and we've got survive the night by Riley Sager I don't like unreliable narrators. Also add to the fact that it's often, not always, not in all those cases, but often women who have mental health issues and it's like, that makes them unreliable. Do you know what I mean? I just don't like it. I don't like unreliable narrators. I don't think. Well, actually no, that's a lie. Here's the thing. I do sometimes like unreliable narrators. Sorry, I'm lying to you. I did tell a bit of a lie there. But I did tell a bit of a lie there. But it's when it's done in a way that is like, I think to do with mental health or a disability, like in Rock, Paper, Scissors, her husband, the husband in the relationship has face blindness. And I just don't like it when disability or, I don't know if you'd call face blindness a disability. Sorry if I'm incorrect there, but you know what I mean? Um, you know, in, in Silent Patient, we've got a woman who killed her husband and doesn't speak and there's something mentally wrong with her everyone says in survive the night she has some kind of like trauma mo imagines movies <laughs> imagines movie scenes in her brain i don't know but when someone's like mental health or health in general is used as an excuse for them to be an unreliable narrator i don't like that i just think it's a cheap way out and i think it can be offensive to many people i do like it when an unreliable narrator is just shady if you're just shady and just not telling us everything then i like that you know if you're like oh, a bit creepy a little bit suspicious and we can't trust you then i do like that but when it's played up on health aspects i don't like that i find it cheap and finally, yeah, we had unreliable narrator, but like is unreliable because of mental health issues or disabilities or, you know, being 
divergent from divergent being divergent from what the average person is like i don't think i know the correct way to phrase all of that but i don't like it when authors do it it feels like a cheap shot makes me angry especially when it's woman mentally ill right oh my god she's a woman and she's like depressed so like of course she's a liar i hate it oh i hate it it really really annoys me i was angry i was angry but like i said i actually love an unreliable narrator if they're shady, right? I read murder mysteries. <laughs> if it, you know, it turns out a narrator is unreliable, we know we can't really trust a narrator. Like, if we know that it's just because we can't really trust them, I like that. But just don't be like a oh, woman, woman with I don't know, insert mental illness here. <laughs> we can't trust her. Do you know what I mean? I hate, I hate that. It just it offends me. It offends me. So that's a surefire way for me to rate your book, Liar. So there we have it. That is my one to two star, <laughs> one to two star audit. I feel like we've learned something here and that I should never read romance, <laughs> never finish series and never read murder mystery again because the, in case they betray me, I'll give it a two star if they do. <laughs> Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I love doing these audits. It's so interesting. I don't know what other audits we can do, but it's it's interesting like evaluating my reading. I'm a bit of a stats girly, you know? So I really like evaluating stuff and thinking what's the truth behind the ratings? I don't know. Um, again, make sure you check out Atlas VPN down below. Thank you so much again to them for sponsoring this video. And if you got onto the end, what should we comment? Comment the thumbs down emoji. <laughs> Everyone's gonna get onto the video and be like, why does everyone hate Megan? Comment the thumbs down emoji if we got to the end for all of the one and two stars that exist in the world. And I'll see you very soon in another video. Bye.